Macbeth. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, creeps in this petty pace from day to day, to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools, the way to dusty death, out, out brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of the sound of and fury, signifying nothing. Act 5, Scene 5. Thank you for reading that, Sophie. This is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the Humanities Teaching App. And, as you can tell, I am joined by Sophie LaCour today, and we're going to be doing our fifth installment of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And I love having Sophie read a little bit of Shakespeare to start us off. It sets the ambiance and the tone for our discussion. I don't know if I have particular commentary about this poem, but I don't know if that's absolutely necessary. I think what's really wonderful about engaging the poetic works of of Shakespeare is that it transports us to another place and we can see the role that that plays in the spiritual life of John the Savage who is interacting with this brave new world and maybe for a moment there you were able to tap into that ethereal spiritual realm as well because Sophie is such a wonderful reciter of poetry so thank you for doing that Sophie thank you <laughs> So, it's been a little bit of uh, time since we last talked. Um, it's been about a month, and during that time, between episodes four and five, I did a little bit of um, outside extra credit homework and researched some subject areas that I think will be helpful for us to understand Huxley's Brave New World a little better. Um, but before I launch into those um, items, I wanted to give Sophie a chance to share any information that she may have encountered in that time in between lessons. I know, Sophie, you've been telling me on Facebook about a book you've been reading recently and that you were seeing some corollaries between it and Brave New World. I don't know if this is the time that you wanted to share that or maybe later in the lesson, but I wanted to defer to you before I got going here. Yes, uh, I recently uh, uh, bought uh, a, an e-book uh, of a, a French book, uh, which uh, I think it uh, was published very recently, uh, about uh, the other individualism. In, it, in France, in, it is uh, l'autre uh, individualism. Uh, and from uh, uh, the author is Alain Laurent. And uh, the, it, it, the subject uh, is about uh, the misconception we have about the word individualism, which is often used as a synonym uh, of uh, egoism. Uh, whereas uh, it, in history, it, it was not at all the case in the past. And uh, recently, it has become a synonym of, uh, in, of egoism in the minds of uh, majority of the population and uh, he is explaining uh, 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 the anti-individualism uh, um, trend there which uh, occurred in the intellectual uh, life of the 20th century and uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and he is explaining what, in in his mind, is a, a good, uh, good understanding of the notion of individualism. And it sounds, yeah, it sounds like it sounds like it would work really well with Soren Kierkegaard's conceptual yes. conception of individualism. Yes, he included some texts about uh, authors, and he he talks about uh, Kierkegaard several times, and he included. Uh, uh, a work of him. I, I I haven't read it yet, but uh, he included uh, some uh, some writings of Kierkegaard. Can you name the author and book once more? Uh, Alain Laurent. So it's uh, I, it's uh, his French, and I don't think the word uh, the book is translated into English. 
Um, I think it's a very recent book. And um, the interesting part in relation to Brave New World is, as I told before in the previous uh, episodes <laughs> of, uh, of uh, this uh, study of Brave New World, uh, is that um, this Brave New World society is very... Uh, um, very against individualism and uh, it prevents people to be alone and uh, one of the reasons why is that uh, uh, someone uh, who is alone and who develop autonomous thinking is very dangerous to a totalitarian regime yes Yes, that's why they have to send them away to islands and lighthouses, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which we'll get into today. Um, excellent points, excellent points. Is there anything else you'd like to share, Sophie? Um, I've also been interesting uh, in... Uh, I've started to, 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 to do some research about uh, Nietzsche and Anna Arendt, uh, Arendt mm -hmm. the two philosophers. And uh, because uh, they also uh, thought about uh, this notion of the individuality and against uh, uh, mass, uh, the, the individual against the mass and the political implications. <laughs> Hannah Arendt is one of my absolute favorite thinkers, and I hope we take her up at some point in the future. I, I flatter Sophie all the time because I think, I think she's a... Uh, a reincarnation of Hannah Arendt. Oh. I think she. <laughs> I hope. I hope. I hope that you uh, leave an impression on society like she did. She was. She was yeah. probably the most magical surprise of all my graduate yeah. um, learning. Is when I was introduced to Hannah Arendt. She's the most underrated thinker of the the twentieth century. And I don't know if it's because she's a woman. I don't know if it's because she's always playing second fiddle to Heidegger. I've never really quite understood why she doesn't have a greater notoriety. Maybe it's because she was. Not necessarily trained to be a philosopher. Uh, she was a journalist. No, she was a philosopher. She she studied philosophy. She had a PhD in philosophy. Did she have a PhD in philosophy? Okay, I did not know that. For some reason, I thought she didn't get her PhD in philosophy. Well, I'm sorry. I was incorrect about that. But um, but she was working as a journalist, was she not? Oh, uh, probably. But I think she she was a little bit disgusted by philosophy. Uh, when the when she saw that some uh, German philosophers embraced Nazis' ideas, and so she she uh, she was a little bit more uh, she was a little bit disgusted about philosophy and was more interested in politics after this, because she saw that some philosophers uh, fall into the Nazi uh, ideology trap and defended the Nazi ideology, and she, she was very angry about it. <laughs> you know, um, oh, I think you're, let me just, this was a surprise to me, and I want to share this information to people about Hannah Arendt's education. Uh, Wikipedia says, after completing her high school studies in 1924, she enrolled at the University of Marburg, where she spent a year studying philosophy with Martin Heidegger, according to Hans Jonas, her only German-Jewish classmate. In her year at the university, Arendt began a long and problematic romantic relationship with Heidegger, for which she was later criticized because of his support for the Nazi party, while he was rector at the University of Freiburg. After a year at Marburg, Arendt spent a semester at Freiburg University attending the lectures of Edmund Husserl. In 1926, she moved to the University of Heidelberg, where in 1929 she completed her dissertation under the existentialist philosopher psychologist Karl Jaspers. Her thesis was something in German that I cannot pronounce, on the concept of love in the thought of St. Augustine, attempt at a philosophical interpretation. That's right. I'm sorry I got that wrong, everyone. And Sophie was correct. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I've, I've been listening to a, a radio podcast on the Fast Cultures Radio about an Arendt, which was fascinate, fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, wow. Well, I totally forgot that she studied Augustine. That's that that's awesome. That's and awesome. And she studied Kierkegaard as well. 
And it's Kierkegaard who, who got her interested in philo philosophy. Because before, when she was in a teenager, she was most interested in poetry. And he's the one who uh, took her from poetry to, to philosophy. <laughs> What's interesting to me is that uh, Kierkegaard may take me out of philosophy and lead me to poetry. So he's having the opposite reaction, <laughs> or opposite effect on me. Well, um, I think we should get into this conversation of Huxley, unless you have more that you want to relate to us. No, I think we, we talk about the essential things I, I wanted to okay. share. <laughs> well, I appreciate you sharing them, and hopefully other people have found that enlightening as well. So the first item of business that I wanted to let everyone know about, it's kind of dark, but we need to face down the darkness that is in our culture. Um, as everyone who knows who's read uh, Out of Suxley's Brave New World, the way that he demarcates time is that we're living in a, in, a, in a dystopian world that is after Ford, AF. I believe it happens at around 600 AF. Um, it's very interesting because there, of all the uh, industrialists, technologists, uh, individuals that we could mark time with it it's significant that huxley picked henry ford and i never really scratched that too much until in between episodes four and five and i found an article from the washington post it's a commentary called the dark legacy of henry ford's anti-semitism mm. i did not know that henry ford was an anti-semite and that's very problematic because many people in america uh drive ford products and if they knew that henry Ford was an anti-Semite, maybe they would think twice about that. But just to give a quick summation of the article, and everyone can go research it for themselves, it was a pretty interesting article about how Ford owned this newspaper called the Dearborn Independent. And apparently his newspaper published a number of anti-Semitic articles and the Protocols of Zion, which is a pretty mm. big deal. Um, and, and Hitler seems to have admired Ford. Mm. Um, Ford is the only American named in Mein Kampf. This little known fact adds an interesting color to the brave new world that occurs, like I said, after Ford. No doubt Huxley would have been familiar with Ford's views. And I, I asked the question here, is Huxley telegraphing that the brave new world will be a Nazi utopia, anti-Semitic dream? Or are we perhaps reading too much into this this demarcation of time. It's also confusing because he um, names several characters within Brave New World after Marxist figures. We haven't really talked about this too much, but obviously there's Lenina and there's Bernard Marx. So maybe we're looking at around, we're not only looking at a critique of the materialistic capitalism, but a critique of not so, national socialism and, and communism as well. I just wanted to bring that to our attention. It is not an insignificant detail that Huxley... Uh, had this dystopic future occur after Ford and that Ford was a known anti-Semite at the time. I have several things to say about it. Please, uh, please. First, uh, the fact that he mixed uh, Nazi, Nazi uh, and Nazi ideology and, commu Nazi, uh, and communist uh, totalitarian regimes uh, in his story is a bit like Anna Arendt. He he really see the common points between the two, and uh, yes, and uh, which, in fact, there there are a lot of common points between these two uh, regimes, and uh, especially this uh, the fact that some people were deport de deported and uh, a lot of people were uh, killed uh, were in concentration camp in both uh, regimes and also, also the fact that uh, these two regimes were very much against individuality and uh, against people who, who are intellectuals. Yeah, doesn't it seem like that any way you try to skin the cat, you ultimately end up at something anti-individual. If you go the capitalist route, everyone gets wrapped up in the mechanistic process of consumerism and then obviously the pitfalls that are involved in Nazism and communism. It seems like just whatever system that humans come up with, it's always going to be anti-individual. Yes. And uh, uh, about uh, what you talked about, about Ford, uh, there, there have been uh, several uh, documentaries and uh, 
maybe uh, articles about the links between uh, uh, American comp big companies and the Nazi regime and how, how they, they had relationship with, with one another. And uh, especially there is a movie which I should see, but I haven't see, seen yet. It's uh, uh, the corp. It's called the corporation, and mm. uh, a part of uh, it is about how uh, the notion of uh, a, comp a corporation. Uh, if a, if a corporation was a person, uh, it would be psychopathic, and uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, they explained this, and I think they talk about this particular period of history in which uh, American companies like uh, Ford helped the Nazi uh, regi regime. Yeah, something that I didn't get a chance to research, so I don't want to talk about it as if I'm some sort of authority on it, but I, I did see some traces of the eugenics program mm. associated with this line of thought as well. I, d I can't back it up. I have no documentation or proof, so I won't say anything more about it. But it wouldn't surprise me if um, yes, uh, if, if, if known American industrialists were also in favor of, the, of a eugenics program that Hitler was trying to institute. So I, I don't have any proof of that. Uh, it's something that I need to further research. So, you mm. know, don't take what I'm saying here as authoritative. I've read articles about the, the, the links, the ide ideological links between that Nazism, uh, Nazi ideology and capitalism. And uh, in fact, there is a lot of common points. And, uh, and actually, the, the Nazi ideology would be uh, an attempt of the cap capitalism uh, uh, system to, to survive. And, uh, and uh, actually, um, in the Brave New World, they talked about um, uh, Maltes, uh, which... Uh, who uh, elaborated a, a theory about uh, population? Uh, That's right. A, a That's theory right. Theory about population, and he was uh, afraid of overpopulation, and he inspired yes. uh, uh, a, a very uh, influential um, um, uh, theorician of economy, uh, Ricardo. They were yeah. close to one another, and Ricardo was really at the origin of the major, main, uh, uh, the main uh, I ideas that we uh, that in capitalism uh, today. And uh, like uh, he, he, I think he was the one who really uh, st uh, elaborated the free market and everything. That, uh, all the ideas we have today with uh, uh, liberal re liberalism uh, economy theory. Well, we'll we'll see that Huxley himself and other works, um, and I'll address that here shortly. He uh, he became very preoccupied with the uh, the overpopulation thesis. Um, and I have some criticism for that that I'll share. Um, but we probably should move on to the second order of business. Um, which is, I found this really incredible essay that Aldous Huxley composed on his deathbed. I don't know if Sophie got a chance I, to, to read it. It's called Shakespeare in Religion. Did you get a chance to look over it? Uh, did you? Um, I sent it to you. I made a recording of it too, but it's okay if you didn't. It wasn't required. I, I read the, the part which you copied to... Uh, oh No, I haven't read the, the, the essay. <laughs> Well, it's very short, and everyone should take the time to do it. Um, it's, it's interesting. I, it's not so, something that not a lot of people know is that Aldous Huxley actually died on the same day as C.S. Lewis and JFK. And What's he, really unfortunate, yeah. And he was born in the same, not the same year, but the same day as uh, Carl Jung. <laughs> oh, really? Interesting. Wow. The coincidences just keep adding up. Um, so the world lost a lot that day, but we all really, all, in America, I don't know, I don't, I don't think it's probably remembered the same way in France, but, uh, w you know, a lot of us, when we think about that day, uh, I believe it was in November, um, we typically only think about JFK's death, and the world lost a lot that day, I mean, losing C.S. Lewis and Aldous Huxley in the same day. 
It's kind of a shame that we don't remember them in the same way. Um, and you can find uh, a copy of this essay on SirBacon.org. Um, you'll, I, I'll have when I upload my notes to the Noetic app, you'll be able to see the links. But um, this is a very interesting piece. Huxley talks about how Shakespeare's theology might be assembled from the utterances of his characters. Um, and we have to ask, what are Huxley's conclusions? And he says Shakespeare's theology looks largely Protestant, but has some Catholic residue as seen in concepts such as purgatory. Huxley thinks that something can be said for a theology having many facets, voices, and views. Uh, and Shakespeare, according to him, was not interested in creating a metaphysics that would justify God to man, which is a position I really find myself identifying with lately. Um, he was more interested in holding up a mirror to nature and showing the dynamic quality of spiritual evolution. And one can see how this is going to feed into Huxley's justification for his own personal sort of mysticism, which I'll touch on here in a moment. But I highly recommend it. It's a short essay, and the man wrote it on his deathbed, so it's kind of the last great gas from this towering intellectual. Um, is there anything you would like to say about this before I move on to the next no, you, item on our agenda? You can move on. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, something else I had the opportunity to do was to read through the uh, up-to-date version of Brave New World, Brave New World Revisited from 1958. And this was an absolutely fascinating read, and you can get it on archive.org. Um, there is also a recording of it on YouTube. And it was a great read, though I didn't necessarily agree with all of Huxley's conclusions, some of which we've talked about already in terms of population control. But I wanted to highlight some of the more pronounced um, views that are in the book that we don't necessarily see in Brave New World itself. Um, and may, we could do a whole discussion on Brave New World Revisited, but I had, I think, four or five points that I thought were absolutely essential to relate to our listeners. Um, the first, Huxley discusses whether or not he or Orwell predicted the future better. So it was kind of interesting to hear him identify his competition. And he seems to indicate that it depends on the decade one is in. He thought you know, at the, in the 40s, it looked a little bit more like Orwell had gotten it right. But at the time of him writing this, which was 1958, he felt pretty comfortable that his own prediction was the truer one. But um, that moves me, gets me to the second point. Huxley did not intend for his prediction to come true so quickly. And I, I thought this was a really profound point. It was a fanciful idea to consider since it was to him at the time so far off into the future. Never did he expect that it would really happen, that he could begin to see it happen in his lifetime. This is 1958, so one can only imagine what's happened between now and 2017, or then in 2017, I should say. One can contemplate with some delight far off dystopian futures, but when they come hurtling at you, it can be quite terrifying. That's probably why so many of us have taken an interest in Brave New World not now. I remember thinking that dystopian novels seem kind of juvenile. My perspective has definitely shifted on that, so I understand Huxley's sense of dread. And I thought this was an excellent point. You know, I don't know if you had the same experience, Sophie, but it's always fun to to contemplate far off sci-fi futures. Like I just saw the new Brave uh, I saw the new Blade Runner movie and it was absolutely mesmerizing. But if that thing started happening in real life, <laughs> I don't think I would have enjoyed it as a movie so much. I would have started to look at it as a documentary. So, um, I thought this was a really profound point that Huxley was talking about. He got a great deal of joy writing Brave New World. Uh, but then when he started to see it come true, it just totally he started to become freaked out by his own writing. What do you think about that? Yes, I've, I've always been uh, interested, although I didn't read uh, that much uh, when I was younger, but I, I've always been interesting uh, in uh, dystopian uh, and utopia as well, because I, I really like to imagine how things could be or, and uh, to speculate about what the future would look like. And I've always been interested in these stories. Uh, but um, I think uh, Brave New World is very, uh, is, is very logical. And if you, you take into account uh, uh, psychology. And uh, I wonder if, um, if uh, Aldous Huxley uh, read... Uh, the Discourse of, on Voluntary Servitude by Etienne de la Boétie. 
which is a, an mm. essay uh, which uh, explain how uh, ty tyranny happens and uh, the notion that uh, I've already talked about it in the previous uh, episodes, but uh, uh, the, the very important notion is that uh, uh, the power of the tyrant comes from the, su the submissiveness of uh, his uh, sub subjects, of the people of, of his uh, group or country. And, uh, and uh, if people decided not to serve the tyrant anymore, he would lo lose all his power. And uh, yes. this, I and it was in the sixteenth, written in the sixteenth century. So, is, maybe Aldous Aldous Huxley had the same, uh, came to the same conclusion, or he maybe he he r r r read uh, his book, and uh, the idea that uh, a totalitarian regime could could happen. Uh, um, and uh, the people in this regime would be uh, conditioned to, to be submissive and to like their servitude. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Huxley read it. I mean, he was such a man of wide learning. Um, I, think it, if, I think it's impossible for him to ignore such a text. You'll have to, send that, you'll have to send that to me as well. I, want, I, would like to, I would like to read that. I'm sure you have before. It just gets lost in the stack sometimes. Um, that's a great point. Um, uh, these last couple points in regards to Brave New World Revisited, I think, Sophie, is something that you may that may intrigue you, given what I know about the things that you research, and I think you might want to go deeper into it. But uh, uh, Huxley asked himself in Brave New World Revisited why his prediction came to be so quickly, and he blamed the matter on rapid uh, population increase. And, and this is where you can see sort of the Malthusian thinking affecting uh, his views on the matter. And that this led to impersonal, impersonal forces, if you can see my air quotes, uh, that's what I think about impersonal forces, to coordinate that structured future faster than uh, he imagined. Uh, in this text, Huxley is very concerned with population rates and seems rather preoccupied with keeping the birth rate down so as to prevent his vision from obtaining any further. And he's alarmed that uh, a lack of global resources will lead to the very dictatorship he pronosticated. And he also, and I also think it's kind of interesting because it's part of the American conversation in politics. He also wanted to prevent um, politicians from how much they could uh, spend on their campaigns. He thought that was uh, the, the influx of money into the coffers of the different political parties was also hastening this uh, brave new world dictatorship. And that's a conversation that we're having in America. I'm not sure it's happening in France. I'm sure it is. Um, but we've had uh, several um, acts that have, have tried to, to, I believe the McCain Feingold act, if, if memory serves me correctly, uh, was, um, was articulated specifically for this reason over here. I'm not sure if you have anything similar going on in France. No, but there there have been some polemics about uh, how much money uh, the different candidates spent on their campaign, especially the one who lose who lost, and who spent a lot of money. And the people say that they they were not uh, they didn't use money properly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been very interesting over here. I mean, because um, uh, Donald Trump uh, ran a very at least on the surface, it looks like you ran a very unconventional campaign um, because, I mean, suppose I, I don't know how it all breaks down. I don't really don't follow these things, but he was an air quotes, self-made billionaire. So he didn't have to rely on uh, the traditional sources of funding like previous political uh, campaigns. But again, you, you can, uh, you can perhaps uh, sense the uh, irony in my voice when I said that. Let's move on to the next topic here. Um, I got a chance to read Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception as well and see how it influenced or maybe leaves off um, or, or develops certain themes of Brave New World. Um, I, many people know that the band, The Doors, got their name from Aldous Huxley's The, the Doors of Perception. And I believe, if I'm 
I, ha I have to look more into this. I think The Doors of Perception is actually a reference to a William Blake poem called, like, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. I didn't get a chance to research that as much. Have you read The Doors of Perception, Sophie? No, but I've watched a video uh, which uh, uh, is um, a summary of this book. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Um, and do you... If you if you maybe maybe if you have a moment to pull up that video, you can share it with people and and let them know where they can where they can find that. But just to give you my take on it, it's a it's a philosophical essay where Huxley explores the spiritual and psychological effects of mescaline. Um, uh, it reminded me a great deal of Baudelaire's The Double Chamber that we discussed. Yeah, also, um, one can see the effect it had on uh, Timothy Leary. I don't know if if. People in France know who Timothy Leary is. He's kind of this drug guru that we had uh, in the 60s and 70s here that influenced a lot of intellectuals. And Huxley describes the timeless dream that mescaline is and advocates this idea that one can feel their own interconnectedness with everything else while on mescaline. Um, the biggest downside being the laziness that it brings on. And Huxley thinks it would make us a great deal more peaceable and is better than the drugs we already have within society, i.e. alcohol and cigarettes. And uh, in conclusion, he thought we needed to open up these doors of perception. Now, I didn't necessarily agree with these conclusions, but we'll talk about that at the end. If you want to get a greater sense of uh, Huxley's um, uh, mescaline-fueled uh, mysticism, there's a great article from Brain Pickings. It's a blog and an online magazine that I believe Sophie and I both enjoy, uh, put together by Maria Popova. Uh, it's called Aldous Huxley on Drugs, Democracy, and Religion. You can check that out. And for even further reading, there are essays uh, uh, that were bound into a book called Moksha, Aldous Huxley's Classic Writings on Psychedelics and the Visionary. Um, and I've got a link for that uh, to Amazon. Is there anything else you'd like to say about these issues, Sophie, before we move on to the next issue? Uh, I've also uh, watched a, a video uh, from a psychologist who talks, uh, uh, I think he's very famous, uh, Jordan Peterson. And oh, okay, yeah. He talked about uh, an, exper an experiment which was made uh, with people who were uh, in terminal illness uh, and they gave a, a very powerful uh, drug to them and they had a mystical experience which uh, uh, and the one they they made a very serious uh, experiment and some of the people had a placebo and the other had the real drug and they noticed that the one who had the who took the drug uh, were uh, very uh, very much uh, uh, more uh, positive uh, uh, and less depressed than uh, the other one. And uh, he said that we cannot know if the mystical experience is real, but we, what we can see is the effect it had on their, on their mood and their, um, their mental uh, um, state. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of young people in America who are turning to drugs for mystical experiences. Um, I have to say that that should be exercised with great caution. Mm. Um, we have a bit of an epidemic in this country. Uh, and I've, let's just say, um, let's just say that unearned spiritual knowledge, uh, can open oneself up to not, not everything that's spiritual is, uh, is kind, I'll, I'll say this: if we are if we are talking about opening up doors of perception, we're not always letting in angelic entities. Now that I know that sounds like a crazy person talking, um, but I think uh, you know we also open up the possibility of something much more sinister and dark coming in as well. Yeah. So I, I have my own conclusions on that, and and it kind of leads into my next point uh, 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 that offers somewhat of a. A, a buffer against this mescaline mysticism. And by the way, I'm glad you brought up Jordan Peterson. He seems to be gaining sort of an iconic cult status amongst um, younger people who uh, are kind of rejecting uh, traditional academia in America. Um, he's, he teaches at the University of Toronto, I believe, and he's become very popular 
uh, amongst people probably under the age of 30. Um, he has a lot of, has a lot of clout on social media and whatnot. He's a very, very interesting figure. Um, so this fifth point on, I wanted to address why Huxley ultimately, although it's not explicit in Brave New World, it seems like he gives a very sympathetic um, reading of Christianity. But in his own personal life, Huxley confessed that he rejected Christianity. And I wanted us to understand really what his intellectual grounds were for doing that. And I, I want Sophie to read this. But in a writing called Ends and Means, he, he pretty much discloses why he rejected Christianity in, in favor of this mescaline mysticism. And, and Sophie, if you wouldn't mind, would you, would you read this passage? Okay. Uh, I have to... Okay. Oh, it's on, it's on the bottom of page okay. 16 of my notes. I found this. Um, I had motives for not wanting the world to have a meaning and consequently assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with a problem in pure metaphysics. He is also concerned to prove that there is, there is no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to do. For myself, as no doubt for most of my friends, the philosophy of meaninglessness, meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. The supporters of this system claimed that it embodied the meaning, the Christian meaning, that insisted of the world. There was one admira admirably simple method of confuting these people and justifying ourselves in our erotic revolt. We would deny that the world had any meaning, whatever. So the reason why, and Sophie, that was very beautifully read. Um, I always think everything sounds better when you read it. Um, the reason why I wanted to share this, you know, Aldous Huxley is someone that many individuals elevate as some sort of prophetic godlike figure. And and what I want to do here is I want to make sure that we properly see all these individuals in their context. Okay? Like these are people. These are flawed people and sometimes they come to certain intellectual conclusions not because of where the evidence leads them, but because they have motives. And before we go elevating Huxley as this mescaline priest that we all need to follow, we need to understand things like this passage right here where he discloses the truth of the matter. So just take, you know, use your discernment in everything that I say, everything that Sophie says, everything that Aldous Huxley says. We're all people. We all have motives. We all make mistakes. So I just wanted to offer that so we don't, we don't enter into this process where we deify out as Huxley. It's very easy to do that since he got so much right about the brave new world. Is there anything you'd like to say before moving on to the next point, Sophie? Yes, it seems to be a very nihilistic uh, vision of existence. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a shame because cause his viewpoint is one that I think... Uh, is shared by many, many brilliant people. And when you look at it, it's actually, it's quite stupid. It's quite selfish to deny all of metaphysics simply because you want erotic liberation. At least, I'll give Huxley credit, at least he's being, being intellectually honest. Yes. You know, he's, he's not denying meaning on metaphysical grounds. He's denying it because he wants sex and he wants drugs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, and it, it shows that it's not an intellectually hon honest uh, position. And uh, it, someone who is uh, intellectually, uh, uh, who really wants to know the truth, uh, he, 
he, if he wants to deny the existence of the met metaphysical world, uh, he would uh, find other arguments. <laughs> true, 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 true. It's quite the gamble. All right, so lastly, this is a bit of trivia. I just thought this was interesting. You know, there's this sort of fictitious song in Brave New World. Um, the line is, hug me till you drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. Hug me, honey, snuggly bunny. Love's as good as Soma. And um, I thought to myself, wow, that's a, that would be a really brilliant lyric. Is this from an actual <laughs> song? And I, I went searching, and it's not from an actual song. I, Huxley just wrote a song into the book, and I thought, oh, that's genius. I wonder if any band took the cue to go and make a song around this lyric. <laughs> and, uh, and, and not really. There was one band that I found. It's kind of a, um, a glitchy post-rock band called Pendulum, and they have a song called Coma, and um, they include probably the first half of the lyric uh, in, in the song, but it's, it's repetitious. It's kind of a slow dance song, um, electronic dance song. But it just it makes me wish that I still did music. I would write a whole song um, mm -hmm. with this lyric in it, you know? What did you, what did you think about the Pendulum song? Did you like um, it? I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's up your alley. I, I kind of know what you like musically. I don't think you would like this one. Yes, I just I I it didn't leave a, a big impression on me. <laughs> it's 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 the only reason why it's really significant is the the connection to Brave New World. I didn't find anything about it uh, to be life changing in terms of music, but at least someone did it. At least they did it. At least they showed up, right? You know. I I also saw uh, there was a false advert advertis uh, advertisement. A campaign about Soma. You can find oh, it really? on YouTube. People who made false, uh, fake advertisements about Soma, and they were very realistic, and you, <laughs> and it was very funny to watch. Oh so, well, so, we trust uh, Soma. The 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 drug they are taking in Brave New World. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, maybe maybe Soma is mescaline. Um, or very close to it. I think, uh, I think Huxley thought that uh, um, if only mescaline could be perfected, we may have Soma. Mm -hmm. um, it, so, all right, let's get into the actual text. I, I know we took a while to discuss those things, but um, I think they would, I, I think that's information that people would find valuable. <clears throat> so we're going to be talking, we're going to finish the book today, hopefully. Um, so, in chapter 15, that's where we're going to begin today, uh, Walt, in the hospital vestibule, John sees Deltas line up for their Soma, and, oh, brave new world, reverberates around his noggin. Inspired, John yells at them to give up the drug. They fail to respond. This causes John to lose it, and he throws their Soma out the window. A riot erupts amongst the Deltas. Bernard and Helmholtz at attempt to rescue John from the riot, but end up being dragged into it as well. Then all three are arrested once the police arrive. So John is seeing through the illusion of the brave new world and is understanding how messed up it is. John's criticism leads to social instability, and it takes some soma vapors and anti-revolutionary words to calm the crowd. It's worth noting that John resorts to violence when anyone doesn't understand his vocabulary or values, making it hard to see John as an idealistic, heroic revolutionary when he resorts to violence. And we have to remember that he gets the violence from his upbringing in the Shakespeare all mixed up. So the question is, that I wanted to ask Sophie, is John someone to be admired? Does the resort to violence automatically disqualify him from moral admiration? I mean, I, something that I was thinking about is, you know, there's Jesus Christ himself who drove the money changers from the temple after all. I mean, he used a whip and John uses a whip uh, later on. So, so how do we feel about John's actions? What, what, what do you think about this, Sophie? Uh, d did he really hit someone? I, 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 I can't remember. I don't know if in this scene, in the end where, where he's in the lighthouse, he breaks out the whip. And it whips everybody up into a frenzy, frenzy and they have an orgy-porgy. I don't know. I can't recall if he uses the whip in this scenario. 
I don't think he, I, if memory serves me correctly, I don't think he does, but don't quote me on that. But later on, he will use the whip. Yes. So in what, what uh, this uh, passage, uh, this uh, made me think about is uh, uh, how uh, uh, isolated uh, revolutionary people uh, act and the, the, the reaction, reaction to, to, their, to their acts. And uh, so he's, uh, he's be, it's, uh, it would be interesting to link this with the, the book um, the, um, the, the Rebel, uh, L'Homme Révolte yes. of Al yes. Albert Camus. And, uh, and uh, so he's really, uh, he has hit a point in, in which uh, he cannot stand this society anymore. And he, he drives him crazy and he wants to save the other people which he realizes are enslaved. But the other people want to remain slaves because of the comfort of being a slave. Yeah, they're addicted to the psychological effects of Soma. They don't want to have to encounter any sort of frustration in life. Yes. And I think it's a bit the same in, in society today. We are enslaved by consumption society, but it's very hard to, to, to um, drop out uh, from the system and to, <laughs> to live without uh, this consumption society. <laughs> do you ever have the urge? Do you, have, do you ever have the urge to, uh, to, 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 take something from people and just throw it away. Like I think about those scenes. Um, uh, I, have you seen E.T.? Like I'm, in E.T., uh, Elliot has to dissect a frog and he has, he can't imagine dissecting the, the living creature. So he has a freak out and he lets all the frogs loose. Do you, uh, did you ever see that movie? Or, um, or did you ever see One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest where R.P. McMurphy wants to liberate everyone from the insane asylum and he tries to... Uh, he tries to lift this massive, um, uh, this piece of furniture and, and break and, and break out of their, uh, of their prison, but he's, he's, he's not strong enough to do it. Have you, have you ever had the desire to do that? Just go around and take everyone's cell phone and throw it away or something? Uh, maybe not in acting, but more, uh, I have, sometimes I really want to say things publicly, uh, uh, I don't know, in front of a journalist to, to just for provocation purpose, you know, just to make people think. If I were to give you a bull, if I were to give you a bullhorn and, 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 and promise you that the crowds wouldn't come after you with torches and, and, and pitchforks, what, what would you say? I cannot really uh, understand the, the, the scene. Oh, <clears throat> if you, well, maybe maybe that's best saved for private. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but <laughs> but if you could if you could say to a journalist without any sort of persecution, uh, what would you say? <laughs> Some people are going to watch this video. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, no, you don't have to say. I think it. I you don't would, have to no, say. It. I would. I think I would do a discourse. <laughs> okay. Uh, a discourse about uh, uh, the widespread mi misconceptions um, of people and how they don't want to to um, contradict uh, these misconceptions because uh, it would uh, uh, it would make them feel feel uh, uncomfortable because uncertain it would leave them to a, it would lead them into a state of uncertainty. And uh, people prefer to be uh, in their false illusions than uh, uh, than to see that uh, the world uh, there is so much, so many things which are uh, which are not normal, and uh, uh, that there is much suffering in the world, and that we are partly responsible for this, and. Uh, and especially uh, sometimes 
to, towards people who are uh, uh, di different from the norm. Uh, they're, they're, they tend to be uh, bullied by other people. And uh, pe people who uh, bullied uh, uh, people who other ch children who are different from the norm, they they don't they they don't they are very proud of being part of the norm, and yeah. uh, they yeah. they don't want to hear that uh, that uh, being normal is not necessarily uh, better than being uh, than being uh, not in the majority of the population. So to, so to return to our original question, you wouldn't do anything forceful. You wouldn't throw anyone's soma away, but you would try to engage people with discourse. Yes. Um, but maybe so, I would be a, a bit aggressive in my words, maybe sometimes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? You know what? You know, words are very powerful. Mm. You know, and I think we forget that. I think we forget that, um, that it, the the right words with the right intentionality behind it can be more powerful than um, any any act of violence. So the question is, uh, how how do we get to that point? How do we have the wisdom to say the right thing at the right time to the right person? I think our world is filled with so much psychobabble that we tend to think that there isn't any sort of power in words. But I've had experiences lately where I I've I've if you choose the right words, they're more effective than, I don't know, a bazooka, you know? So yeah. you got to choose your words. You got to, got to choose your words correctly. And more important than words is the, the thought, uh, uh, yes. which is the origin, the cause of, of this world. And so th yes. the, that's why thinking for yourself is extremely powerful. And, yes, uh, yes. That's why these totalitarian regimes uh, want to condition people because thinking is the enemy of tyranny. Yes, precisely. Precisely. All right. Um, may I move on to chapter 16? Yes. <laughs> Okay. I, I do have a passage that I would like to, uh, to read in chapter 16. It was my favorite passage in the whole book. Um, so I'm going to say a little something about it, and then I'm going to read it. And Sophie and I had pretty extensive conversation before <laughs> we did this today. We should, I, we should probably just record those. Or I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't. But we always have, we always have interesting conversations, whether we're on camera or off. But uh, ch in chapter 16, John, Bernard, and Helholtz are all judged by world controller Mustafa Mond. There's an epic discussion of social control, after which Mond ex exiles Bernard and Helmholtz to the Falkland Islands for their role in the riots. Uh, Bernard panics, but Helmholtz digs the idea of being away from the conformity of society. So, I'm going to read this passage now, between John and Mond. Um, and here it goes. That's another reason why we're so... Uh, oh, man... Oh, here we go. I'm going to start again. That's another reason why we're so wary of applying new inventions. Every discovery in pure science is potentially subversive. Even science must sometimes be treated as a possible enemy. Yes, even science. Science, the savage frowned. He knew the word, but what it exactly signified, he could not say. Shakespeare and the old men of the Pablo had never mentioned science, and from Linda, he had only gathered the vaguest hints. Science was something you made helicopters with, something that caused you to laugh at the corn dances, something that prevented you from being wrinkled and losing your teeth. He made a desperate effort to take the controller's meaning. Yes, Mustafa Mond was saying, that's another item in the cost of stability. It isn't only art that's incompatible with happiness, it's also science. Science is dangerous. We have to keep it most carefully chained and muzzled. What, said Helmholtz in astonishment, but we're always saying that science is everything. It's a hypnopedic platitude. Three times a week between 13 and 17, put in Bernard. And all the science propaganda we do at the college? 
Yes, but what sort of science, asked Mustafa Mon sarcastically. You've had no scientific training, so you can't judge. I was a pretty good physicist in my time. Too good. Good enough to realize that all our science is just a cookery book. With an, orthodox, with an orthodox theory of cooking that nobody's allowed to question, and a list of recipes that mustn't be added to except by special permission from the head cook. I'm the head cook now, but I was an inquisitive young scullion once. I started doing a bit of cooking on my own. On orthodox cooking, illicit cooking, a bit of real science, in fact. He was silent. What happened? asked Helmholtz Watson. The controller sighed. Very nearly what's going to happen to you, young men. I was on the point of being sent to an island. Oh boy, did I love this passage, Sophie. <laughs> I, was trying to, I was trying to tell Sophie earlier that I knew some science that I wanted to tell her one day. But it's not the day today. <laughs> and uh, I told him that, uh, I told Luke that uh, uh, there is a physicist in France. Uh, his name is uh, Philippe Guillemot. And uh, he he's uh, um, he also worked in uh, artificial intelligence. So he's both a physicist and a computer scientist. And uh, he wrote uh, several books in order to uh, uh, to explain a more metaphysical theory and to uh, to um, dis to uh, to reveal that uh, a lot of the widespread uh, conceptions we have about uh, the nature of reality uh, are uh, in fact um, wrong because we we tend science has become uh, dogmatic uh, since it has opposed its, itself against uh, religion it has become uh, not so objective and there are also dogmas in science. And uh, in the, uh, he uh, wrote, uh, he published a new book very recently in which uh, he explained these uh, uh, misconceptions that people tend to have and these dogmas of, of, uh, of science. So it's uh, the, the, the Pic de l'Esprit, the, the Pick of the Spirit, and it's uh, written by uh, Philippe uh, Guillemot. Yeah, it sounds absolutely fascinating. And, and Sophie and I traded some information on what's going on in the quantum world. And hopefully when we do things into the future, we can explore those ideas to a greater extent. Um, and I wanted to ask the question here, you know, look, there's nothing... The, the, the frustration that I have, Sophie, is that when people think that you are calling into question mainstream science, that you are anti-science, all right? And this is beyond frustrating to me because, to be honest, I, and I don't like, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to say this without being a braggart, but I have learned and forgotten more science than most people who are willing to call me anti-scientific when I question established doctrine, um, and that sounded terribly uh, uh, proud, but I, I, think I, I think I have to be really honest about that assessment. And we have to really entertain ideas about whether or not science is being muzzled and controlled in our world if it is a parallel to the brave new world. And someone will say, okay, Luke, well, fine, how would that even be possible? Well, I think something we need to take into consideration is fraud, Okay. Could fraud be happening, okay? Could incorrect assumptions be made? Could there be the suppression of evidence? Could there be the suppression of anomalies that would upset established paradigms? Could there be pressure put on certain scientists who are looking into these things and therefore they are silenced, all right? Could there be unverifiable explanations? Could there be equipment that is so delicate and so expensive that it's not up to the public to verify this in, an, in some sort of publicly, publicly demonstrable way. And finally, could there be great financial interest in maintaining the status quo at the universities and many other industries? So I know we want to live in this world where everyone does the right thing and everyone's totally honest and noble. 
But I think we have to be realists here that some of these corrupting factors can enter into scientific discourse, and we have to use a great deal of discernment to determine whether or not that's happening. Now, that may make me sound like a conspiracy theorist. I'll, I'll suffer it. I will suffer that label. But I think if we're really going to be informed citizens, we need to investigate whether or not that is possible. Now, Sophie, will I'll shut up and allow Sophie to respond to that. I think there are there are two factors which we can uh, list as being uh, as being um, obstacle to to uh, good science and uh, which are not polemic to to uh, to um, say uh, because uh, it, and these these two factors are the economic factor and the social pressure factor. And right. these two factors uh, uh, can go in, in the way of uh, doing good science. Economic pressure, uh, so, so Philip Guillemot, he said that, uh, I like the way he say it, he said that science has become techno-science. So uh, yes. the, the projects which are funded are the ones which have technological uh, um, outcomes and uh, so it's good for the economy for the in for the IT uh, industry or and uh, so the, or not only IT but uh, for for the economy it if it has industrial and economical outcomes uh, this uh, research will be favored uh, against uh, other field of research which would uh, uh, make less profit. <laughs> and so that's the, the first uh, factor, uh, I think, which is in the, in the way of doing good science. And the second one is the social pressure. If someone discover, a, if a, a physicist or a scientist in a, any field discover uh, something which is very new, very... Uh, uh, a very new ID which uh, contradict uh, other con um, uh, ID from the past and which is uh, uh, which will probably have a big impact in the way we see the world uh, for uh, there have been many examples like this in history and these people have been uh, uh, persecuted yeah and uh, some some uh, scientists may be afraid of of uh, saying what of divulging what they have discovered because they, oh yeah they they would be afraid at least of being ridiculed no yeah. oh they could lose their job yes yeah, so right could lose their when job. you start, yeah i mean if you have an entire economy if you have tens of thousands of jobs that are predicated on the scientific status quo being maintained. Um, is your discovery really that important for humanity? So then the economic factors start to outweigh the innovation, right? And uh, I think that's something we really have to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, we have to be concerned on how the economic, um, the economic influence the influence of the economy on society and on knowledge and on science. Yeah, yeah, they're, uh, we're living in an era, right, where it's not just like, the science isn't pure anymore, everything's interconnected, right? I mean, there's a lot, there's, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, whether we're talking about pharmaceuticals or we're talking about the aeronautical industry or we're talking about defense systems, I mean, there's a lot of political financial investment in certain outcomes obtaining, right? Um, but that's, that's, I'm probably stepping beyond the confines of this conversation. So, um, but let's, I want to ask Sophia a more theoretical conversation. Suppose you were this bright young physicist, this, and you are, <laughs> if you, let's suppose you were one of these individuals that started to question, uh, scientific orthodoxy, um, and you were given the choice to either go into isolation onto the island 
or do what Mustafa Ma did, which was to control other people's happiness, to reduce it to a science. Um, what would you choose? I mean, Mustafa Mond, you know, he, he tells us why he made his choice. Like he had to, you know, he lived through the nine years war and, and he talks about all the passing sites that were associated with all that, all the devastation. And we'll see that John is very much wants the possibility of being free and to claim those things again. Um, Mustafa Mond knows that the truth can be very dangerous. And so it's he he envies um, Helmholtz and 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 Bernard and and John to some extent, but we can maybe on a rational level understand why he has engaged in the um, the brainwashing of the the iceberg society that is Brave New World. I mean, can would you choose differently, Sophie, or do you, are you sympathetic to Mon? Yes, I think it's very a very difficult decision. And uh, myself, I, th I think every one of us is faced, every one of us who really care about um, being true, uh, searching for the truth and uh, are being faced uh, with this choice of uh, living an authentic, authentic life and on, but w in which we would face many uh, uh, difficult situations or comfort of being uh, in the ma uh, the majority of being in the herd, <laughs> you know. And uh, and in in Brave New World, they they talked about another choice, which is. Uh, very similar to this one between freedom and uh, and happiness, and uh, so John uh, preferred f uh, freedom, uh, chose chose freedom uh, uh, against happiness because uh, in his mind uh, he prefers to suffer from aging, from uh, from uh, pain. And uh, then, uh, then the artificial happiness there is in Brave New World society, because uh, he does not he he values uh, freedom because maybe freedom really makes him feel alive, whereas artificial happiness is making us losing our individuality. Yeah, and I and I understand it. I think if this dichotomy is a true one, I think I would be a John. I think I would I, I can't lie. I would I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing that I was brainwashing people into untruths. So I think I would have to claim all the passing sights that John claims, the ability to sin, the ability to suffer from the sin. Um but I think Huxley, I think Huxley presents us with a false dichotomy here, that oh, we have to choose the truth and degradation, or we have to choose the lie and sustainable happiness. And I'm a big believer in the truth will set you free. Um, you know, Mon justifies a lot of his actions, like oh, well, if you had seen the Nine Years' War, then you would understand why things have to be controlled in this way. I'm not sure the truth has ever really been out there. I'm not sure we would ever have a nine years war. I'm not sure we would have any wars if the truth was actually out there. You know? I, yeah. I, just, I just don't, I don't, I don't believe in this choice. I think, I think the truth would lead to happiness. I, I think the, I think the context of this dichotomy is not the one which we are talking about. I think uh, what well, it's uh, an, indi an individual choice between uh, uh, the the easy uh, way, which is uh, large, and uh, everyone take this easy path. Most people take yeah. the easy path in life, and the authentic path, which is uh, uh, the like the road not taken in the poem. Uh, 
and uh, which is the it, it is a harder to follow the authentic path in life and right right it's also it's also yeah it's also in the bible matthew 7 13 yes. through 14 enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few yes it really makes me think about this and i think it's the kind of it's the same kind of dichotomy which is uh, described in a in this chapter of revenue world and well, you know the, what Nietzsche, the, the truth yeah. has yeah some sometimes it it's more comfortable to be uh, to live in illusion than to i think l- l- the there is a cost to a uh, lucidity to um uh, to be t- uh, to awareness that the more you are aware and the more uh, and it makes you suffer because you are aware of, of all the, the evil and the suffering in the world and uh, and also of your freedom and fr- like and Kierkegaard explained all the psychological uh, uh, phenomena of freedom and uh, he said anxiety is the dizziness of freedom and uh, freedom and and awareness he, he also talks about uh, conscious uh, being conscious of our despair in uh, the sickness and to death and uh, both awareness and uh, freedom are, are potentially uh, giving uh, us uh, very negative uh, emotions and we have to be strong if we want to choose this uh, tiny, uh, difficult path. You know, uh, there was one other interesting thing from this chapter that I think we should mention is that in the conversation with Mond, uh, uh, and I meant, I, I meant to correct myself that the conversation was with all three, not just John, but John does ask Mond at some point, why not just create rather than brain damaging everyone and creating this stratified um, pyramid scheme? uh, Why not just make everyone alphas? And then Mustafa Mann references the Cyprus experiment where I guess they, I can't I think it was Ireland where they turned everybody into an alpha and then, and then a civil war erupted. Um, You know, I don't know, you know, if, if, if the truth about reality was revealed to everyone and everybody was put on the same page, uh, would it ultimately lead to infighting? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it is something to think about when I'm considering this dichotomy about the truth setting everyone free. I think he's trying to justify the the notion of uh, uh, class-based society and uh, inequalities between people. And uh, yes. he's try he's he's just he's trying to justify that we need uh, like like you know in ancient Greece the 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 the, the slavery was not of, uh, the goal of slavery was not the same as uh, during uh, uh, after uh, the uh, uh, um, American uh, uh, discovery from uh, of, uh, European. Uh, con- Con- conquerors, uh, it was not the same, uh, the modern slavery and the ancient Greece slavery, because in ancient Greece, the reason why they, 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 they were slaved, slaves is because uh, Greek, uh, Athens, uh, Greek uh, citizens uh, did not want to work. They hate the fact of working. They, they preferred having intellectual or sports activities and they hated to, they found it degrada- degraded to have to work. There, so mm. the reason there were slaves, it, it because the work, the manual work, uh, the work had to be done so people could eat and could, uh, the society could function. Yeah. And I think it's a problem which is present today and uh, some people are optimistic about uh, uh, about 
uh, automation and artificial intelligence because uh, they say so this way we won't have to work we will have to we we will have uh, our lives for for more uh, interesting activities yeah. idle hands are the devil's playground you know what 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 will people get themselves into i remember i think in the in the book uh they talk about uh shifting the hours around so people didn't have to work so hard but i mean it seems like people just got into vol- all they did were in so- they were just in soma comas the entire time but i if don't I, if memory i don't think everyone would be this way i think uh, some people would make a good use of their time oh yeah yeah but i mean the majority of people i don't know i don't know what the majority Are you sure would do of this? Oh, I, oh no! I'm not sure. I'm, 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 I'm contemplating. I'm not sure what the majority would do. I don't know. It's something interesting to think about. I'm, I'm sure of nothing. Uh, you know, there is some talk. You know, Mark Zuckerberg, the the Facebook guy, uh, has talked about. Uh, he's got this un, sort of unbounded belief in automation and artificial intelligence and universal income. Um, I'm not sure it will bring out the best in humanity. I'm just not sure. I think it needs more investigation. You know, uh, Anna Arendt wrote about this subject in, uh, oh, in did her she? book. Yes, uh, the condition of the... I don't know how it is translated into English, but uh, uh, um, uh, in France, uh, it's about the condition of the modern man. And she, she talks about, uh, in her mind, uh, work... The, could also be used as the uh, mean of uh, uh, establishing a, a tyrannic uh, regime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have to think about it more. I have to think about it more. But uh, we should probably... I, I, we're, we're about at the hour 15 minute mark, and um, I got to eat some lunch. <laughs> so let's... Uh, <laughs> let's uh, Let's uh, let's see if we can wrap up these these final two chapters and tie a bow on our whole conversation. Um, so uh, in chapter seventeen, um, we've talked a little bit about this, but Mond and uh, John discuss the absence of God in the Brave New World, and John identifies how the abolition of frustrations in the Brave New World makes it more difficult to find God, and I find that to be so true. It's as if we need obstacles in order to reach a higher spiritual truth. Mon claims that John foolishly desires the right to be unhappy. We've, we've talked about this already, leading John to a concession of the point. And John must accept the horrors of sickness, poverty, and fear. In this discussion, Mon and John concentrate on the differences between the dystopia and the reservation. Both know about religion. Eh? Mon knows about God and religion from the forbidden books, the Bible, the Imitation of Christ, Cardinal Newman, and William James. And B, John knows about religion from rituals and purifying himself back on Malpai. Mon's argument against God is that religion is totally unnecessary in the society he has created. People only turn to the spiritual world when they experience frustration or deterioration. Since everyone is essentially gratified and free from decay, what need of God is there? And I thought that was a really, really brilliant point. John sees things quite differently. To be constantly stimulated and pleasured is degrading. One needs to practice self-denial and suffering in order to arrive at the good. Comfort is a barrier to spiritual growth. Mon points out that the values of Christianity, those being kindness, patience, long-suffering, are reasonable and are socially valuable. However, Soma, blessed Soma, can do all that without all the painful self-denial. Mon and John have two equally incompatible worldviews, which present us with a choice that Sophie referenced earlier. The antinomy is framed as a choice between freedom and comfort. Freedom entails misery and disease, and John claims them all. So again I ask, is John heroic, or are both John and Mon trapped in false narratives? Is there a higher synthesis possible? Can we think outside these frames of reference, and what would it look like? And I'll just say this, it, you know, it, Huxley's answers to this seem to be the 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 elevation through mystical opiates or, or whatever, but um, I you know I don't really find a lot of uh, a lot of blessed hope in the sort of purification rituals that John undergoes, and I think 
really it seems like the 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 synthesis that we may have beyond this where we can accept the freedom and everything that it that it entails is to um wish for a blessed reunification in that uh beatific vision of Jesus Christ the christian gate the christian narrow gate but um that that's that's my view what is uh, let's hear what sophie's view is i have several things to say about it and the Please. first one is that uh, I read that uh, Aldous Huxley wrote another book, which is another uh, science fiction uh, story. Um, it's Utopia, but this one is more positive, and it's the island. It's oh, island. I'll have to ch- I'll have to check that out. That's fascinating. And uh, I haven't read it, but I. I read that uh, he wanted to correct a bit the end of Brave New World because uh, he he wanted to give a positive uh, soli- solution to this uh, this di- dilemma, uh, uh, and he, he wanted to to uh, to show that there could there could be a society in which individual development is promoted. And uh, I'm so glad you brought that up. But and the other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, I personally think that there is a need to to, to go through some uh, suffering in order to become ourselves. Yes. And uh, so I think there is truth to this, and uh, I think we cannot uh, we cannot uh, escape from this if we want. To to develop uh, as a our personality, if we want to, to develop, we have to to face. Uh, I think there is a, a necessity to to be able to to go to some difficult uh, emotional experience in order to to uh, to become ourselves. Yeah, it raises some very interesting questions about it, what it means to be a person. I, you know, I mentioned earlier that I saw the new Blade Runner movie, and and Sophie, if it, if it's in if it's in French, you should go see it, or if they have subtitles, you should go see it because uh, it addresses this issue. Um, but they have, it's it. I believe it occurs in the year twenty forty nine, but they have um, highly advanced replicant um, uh, androids that look, feel, touch, I mean, they're practically indistinguishable from humans, um, but they are made, they are not born, they, are, they um, use everything that we have in terms of bioengineering to give the appearance of human, um, but they, you know, they don't experience any of these frustrations, so they don't really consider themselves to be people and therefore allow themselves to be subjugated in that movie to humans. Um, and I don't want to give any spoilers away or anything like that, but so, uh, an anomaly occurs that um, starts to plant the seed that maybe they're not just machines. But I, in relating it to Brave New World, I mean, I think it raises the very fundamental question, are people like Lenina and other people that are part of the Brave New World system that are cooked up in these labs, um, are they people? Are they real people? Yes, um, I think uh, there is. A, I I can't remember the name, but uh, there is a, someone who used the word uh, robopath, and uh, in which he described the uh, the majority of the population of people who are not very much uh, self-aware, and he compares them with robots. <laughs> It's, it's, it's these kind of things are very difficult to, to hear, to, uh, and it's a bit provocative, uh, these ideas. And, uh, but the, the, no, the idea is that most people uh, are very much influenced by either their, um, uh, their, uh, by, by, in instinct, their primitive instinct, and by uh, so the social environments, and do not have very much independence from these two factors. 
And yeah. so you can compare them a bit with robots. <laughs> you, you really have to see the movie, Sophie. I want to hear your views on it. Mm. Um, may we move to the final chapter and bring our discussion of this book to a close? Um, as you want, uh, I would like to have dinner too. Uh, I'm a bit tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's just finish it up and be done with it. Uh, shortly... Um, and I think we've talked about some of these issues already. Uh, Bernard eventually calms down from his panic about being sent to the islands or to the Falklands uh, with Helmholtz. Uh, John too plans a retreat from society. We've talked about this. He goes to a lighthouse outside of London and there he purges himself of eating of salvation or civilization. I should say not salvation, civilization, <laughs> which uh, is reminiscent of eating of the apple in the garden of Eden. He fasts, he whips himself, he vomits in order to get rid of the guilt for Linda's death and the sexual contact with Linda. Uh, on cue, uh, the reporters and crowds invade his privacy. Uh, when a lovesick Linda approaches him, John attacks with a whip. Um, a riot breaks out and then an orgy. Yay. You know, whenever they're presented with violence and all this other stuff, they break out into orgies. John awakes the next day, groggy from the Soma, hates what he's done and kills himself. It's a very dramatic ending uh, as he's a... Uh, feet are dangling and pointing in all the different directions. Um, yes, John and is I like said earlier, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, please, yeah, what were you saying? I wanted to say that John is like a tragic, tragic uh, character from a Shakespeare uh, play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it only makes sense since Shakespeare is uh, his favorite author. Yes, maybe, it's, I think it was intended. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder which one he identified with the most. Hmm. That would be an interesting question because he, you know, he quotes so much Shakespeare, yeah. a lot of Macbeth, a lot of Hamlet, uh, a lot from the Tempest. That would be interesting. I bet there's someone who's done some research on that. Um, yes. The end is, is difficult to read. There is a, uh, it's the scene is very difficult. <laughs> it is. It is. It's heartbreaking, but it kind of leads to this idea you know, we've talked about a lot of the ideas about how John's own religious views seem to fall short because it ultimately leads to to suicide. But then are we left with this idea that Bernard and Helmholtz are actually the our ideals? Are these the people that we're supposed to imitate? We're supposed to find our own Falklands and live freely there? Is that what is that what noetic is, right? Where you and I are Bernard <laughs> and Helmholtz and we found this digital Falklands to escape from the institutions and society. Is that what it's all about? That we each have to find our own version of the Falklands? We live in the clouds. Uh, <laughs> and people, yeah. people will say that uh, it's because we do, we, are, we do not want to confront reality. <laughs> so we, we escape from it. <laughs> well, I like our island. Yeah. I like everyone. And I hope, I hope more join us. Maybe it I becomes a very to. populous island. Yes. I hope it will be a very successful island. Yes. I think it will be. It'll be a fun island. It'll be a fun island. All right, Sophie, I want to thank you so much um, for talking about this book. We did five installments of it, and you were very patient with me as I tried to include a lot of information. And uh, I just, I love your insights. I love that we're friends and that we can talk about these ideas and that you make the time for it. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for everything that you do in my life. Thank you so much for everything that you do as well and for your friendship and for you inviting me to do these videos uh, even if I do not have a, um, studied uh, literature and philosophy and uh, I got interested in this uh, by myself <laughs> and uh, so it was very nice to you uh, from you to to allow me to share my thoughts <laughs> about uh, these books and these poems from Baudelaire previously. <laughs> well, I think it's very important to include a plurality of perspectives. Um, uh, academics can get the blinders on and can dismiss people that don't have the same credentials as them. And I don't operate that way. 
I listen to experts and I listen to, um, ever, you know, non-experts. And, uh, I oftentimes find that, um, people who come from a diverse, um, diverse walks of life have more to contribute than the experts because the experts are all taught the same thing. Uh, mm-hmm. they all have to be on the same, they, they have, and it's very hard for them to get outside of, of what is considered to be fashionable, um, intellectual doctrine. So, um, the same problem as is in science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, precisely. So, all right, I have to go eat and, and, uh, and enjoy what's left of this beautiful day. Yes. And enjoy your day and, uh, and I hope you, you learned a lot of things and we gave you some, uh, some references of books which uh, you can read and movies and songs. <laughs> so you yeah, have I a lot we... to, to do after this video if you, if you are interested yeah. in these in this, uh, in this, uh, books or movies or songs. I think so. I think so. All right. I'm going to bring this to a close. Download the Noetic app. You can also watch this on YouTube and and find it on SoundCloud. Take care, everyone. Bye.